Hey everybody, it's Zach. Uh, it's about mm, two f- something in the morning, and I decided to record a, a podcast to describe who I am and explain what I'm about and the advocacy work that I do and kind of give a brief overview of my life and uh, upload it to YouTube to kind of get my channel kicked off. I know it's a podcast. Um, right now, video isn't a thing because when you're blind like I am, it's a little hard to edit video. Um, so... I have to wait for a little bit until I can get a full team to help me with this. But that team is going to do other things as well. So, But uh, as we go along, I'm going to smoke a bowl of cannabis because cannabis is one of the number one cures for a lot of my ailments. And uh, that'll unfold as we go. So uh, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Zach. I'm 26 years old. I was born in 1990. And uh, I've had a pretty cool life. And you're like, why am I listening to this dude? What do you see? You gotta tell me. That's so important. Nothing, really. I mean, I don't really. I'm not. I don't have. A, I don't claim to have a cure for cancer. I don't claim to have a cure for chronic pain. I can point you in the right direction and let you make your own assumptions and try out things. But I just kind of want to <clears throat> tell you about what I went through, so other people can have kind of a guideline of what to expect and what not to expect. So, without further ado, let's get into this. At a month old, I was diagnosed with bilateral retinoblastoma, which is cancer of the eyes, which uh, breaks down to uh, bi is two, so both eyes, lateral, which is also both eyes, retino, which is the retina, or eye, and then blastoma, which is the type of cancer. So, that being said, they found it, and they started doing some experimental treatments, radiation lasers and uh, nothing worked didn't slow it down and by age two or by age one they had uh, taken out both my eyes or sorry wow they taken out one of my eyes my right eye and they thought that would cure it and by age two they found that it was spreading back towards the brain using the optic nerves so they went in and took them both out the optic nerves and the eye the remaining left eye and if, if this seems scattered, like I'm not sure what I'm talking about, it's because I'm these, one of these kind of people who can't write something down and then follow that script because I get off on tangents. So for me, it's just easier to kind of freestyle this. Yeah, at age two, I was completely blind. My family was dealing with a blind two-year-old, which wasn't new for them, actually. My dad, uh, he was blind as well. He had the same thing I did and passed it on to me which was genetics. I mean, can't really do anything about it. Without him, I wouldn't be here. So they did all this stuff, and uh, they finally got the cancer under control by removing the eyes and protecting the brain. And I grew up in a pretty normal household. I did everything I wanted to do. I did it. I did everything that a sighted person would do. I rode bikes, ran around the yard with butcher knives, went out hunting, archery, I had slingshots, I had go-karts, I had quads, I had I had pretty much had anything a normal person would have. I mean, I am normal. Well, kind of. My parents never, well, my dad, my mom's not in the picture, and I'm probably not going to talk about that at this episode, but it'll come up later. But my dad and my grandparents, who helped raise me, are amazing people, and they did so much to keep me on track and in school. I went to public school. I learned Braille which was pretty cool, I guess. I, I, w- I was a dumb kid. I didn't know that Braille was actually going to be my opening to the rest of the world. You know, I wanted to learn I wanted to learn print like everybody else. And my theory behind this was, oh, well, you know, just make the print feelable like Braille. Just raise the print up so I can feel it. But, you know, being a kid, I didn't realize that that was actually more work, more consumption of space on a page via braille which is smaller and you can do a lot more with still big and bulky and hard to produce but a lot more easier than raised print letters uh sorry tangent anyway so uh, growing up in this environment of being visually impaired or well in my case completely blind so uh, let me break those down for you let me break those terms down visually impaired is anyone who has a visual impairment obviously completely blind is someone who can't see at all who either has no vision whatsoever, they can't see light or dark, they can't see shadow, they can't see anything, or they have no eyes. In my case, I'm no eyes whatsoever. I do have eyes, but they're prosthetics. They're made of a a plastic. 
acrylic and totally blind um, and so there are things that you do uh, you learn braille um, they teach you how to use a white cane and they teach you how to wear sunglasses no I'm just kidding Most, it, there's there's actually health reasons for that um, for me it's to keep dust and debris out of my eyes because my eyes don't have natural lubrication like most people's do so it's really easy for them to get irritated so I wear um, sunglasses when I'm out in public out and about um, especially in like high smog situations um, like in big cities or out in like the uh, I used to live in Missouri and the dusty roads of the gravel like they have this red gravel roads or they have these red gravel roads and the dust on that stuff would just get in my eyes and it would just burn it was like so bad I'm gonna take a quick break from talking and smoke a bowl so cannabis I'll talk about that real quick because cannabis is one of my favorite things it's one of my favorite medications it's one of my favorite recreational pastimes I use it in both situations but because of the cancer and because of everything that I've been through there are certain things that I have to deal with like chronic pain my skull has been opened up like a freaking Lego set and they've gone in and reconstructed my face completely like just I, I can't even describe it the amount of times I've been under the knife and had things just done I'm a doctor's high-end erectoset that's basically what I am but because of that the pens the need uh, sorry the pens the wires the plates the screws they all kind of cause us pain and so cannabis helps with that and so I smoke it I feel like I'm talking to myself, which I mean, I, I essentially I am, but I know that there are listeners out there that will hear this, so it's not too weird for me, but I just have to something playing in the background. And what I'm going to do um, for the next one, I think, is I'm going to actually break my guitar out, find a way to play it so that it's quiet enough that's not going to disrupt everybody, but gives me the ability to, uh, to, to keep my hands busy. Because right now I'm fidgeting, I'm like playing with my ladder and stuff. But, back to what I was talking about, as I took on this bowl, with everything that I've been through, cannabis has helped out a lot. Uh, and I'll, I'll keep talking about my medical history and stuff and everything that I've gone through. But So at age, um, age two, both eyes are gone, completely, just gone. And I grew up in a fairly normal household, and because of that, I got to have a lot of really cool opportunities. Me and my grandfather would just go fishing, and we'd get up at like 6, 7 in the morning and get gravy and biscuits and then just head out fishing. And it was really fun to learn how to like fish, you know. Like, oh, okay, I gotta tell you about my grandpa. So, blindness runs in my family, kinda, in a weird way. Me and my dad are hereditary, that's how we lost our sight, through cancer. My grandfather was in Vietnam War, or I'm sorry, in the Vietnam War, I need to learn proper grammar. He was over there, and they were shooting uh, into these trees, not like up into these trees, but like into the like the tree line to suppress fire or something. I guess one of the bullets ricocheted, or one of the, the VC or Viet Cong had set off a booby trap, and what it was is there was this grenade like 10 feet up in the tree. Whatever set it off, it sent shrapnel out in this just devastating wave. It hit like his whole platoon. He said he felt like this, he felt like someone punched him in the face, and then he spun around. And he hit the ground, and he lost an eye because of that. And uh, he woke up in the hospital. And, yeah, so he lost an eye. Then we had a cat, Morris. I miss that cat. He lost an eye due to a cat fight. And then not too long ago, we had a dog, Carmen, who got into a fight with a bulldog, Aggie, and she, uh, Carmen, lost an eye. So <laughs> the whole eye thing is really weird in our family. Now, because of that, we're very understanding. Um, so the thing about me is I was kind of brought into the world with a, a step up because my family had already gone through the blind thing with my dad. So they knew, you know, they knew pretty much what needed to be done and how it needed to be dealt with. Um, everything was fine for, you know, the 
toddler stage, blah blah blah, I go through that whole thing. And then I get to age six. And I'm coming home from school and they notice these bruises on my face and they say, Hey, did you hit your head? Had, but not where the bruises were. They make an appointment with um, the UW, which is Washington University Medical Center up here in Seattle. They take me to my dad's doctor, Dr. Kalina. Really cool dude. Really sweet guy. I don't know if he's still practicing because when I saw him, he was, I want to say in his like early 50s maybe. Um, so he's probably retired by now. But I know that he had a great impact on that place and on me. They found this tumor. I'm summarizing. I'll go into this all. I'll break it down stage by stage over the next few episodes, I guess. But I just want to give you guys an overall scenario. They break, uh, they uh, they do some scans and they find this huge uh, tumor just at the base of my skull, and it spread out. It was sending these tentacles into uh, my brain, like it was like wrapping around the brain. It was eating into the bone, and it was just feeding off these resources and growing they weren't giving me they gave me three months to live which uh, I didn't know at the time I can't stress this enough during this entire process I was never treated like a kid by my parents by my dad my grandma my grandpa I was always treated I was always kept up to date for the most part and I was always allowed to sit in on these appointments and I really appreciate that because I wasn't lied to for the most part. I mean, they didn't tell me I was gonna, had three months to live, but I kind of understand why they didn't tell me that. Even though it irritates me, I understand why. I was always in these appointments, and I was always really involved with everything that was going on. I mean, it was happening to me, so I guess they wanted me to see what everything was going on. So they put me on chemotherapy, and that sucked, as it does. I don't, I, I've, I've never met anyone who has gone through chemotherapy and said that they had a good time on it. Uh, chemotherapy for about a year and or for about a half a year and uh, I dropped out of school well I didn't drop out I was forced to quit two weeks on or no a week of chemo two weeks off a week of chemo two weeks off for a half a year and uh, Halloween the week before Halloween I was, uh, they said okay you're going in for surgery and I was like I'll be out trick-or-treating don't worry <laughs> and uh, they do a 16-hour surgery on me they remove the tumor. Good, good to go. Uh, Halloween, I made a crap ton of candy. I, <laughs> I was out trick or treating. I believe I went as Frankenstein or something. I incorporated the big, huge scar with 182 staples across the top. So that was fun. I danced with the tumors on and off over the next few years until about age 14. That's when the big one hit. This tumor starts growing around my trigeminal nerve. And I wake up and my face is swollen and I'm in a lot of pain and I don't want to go to school. I'm arguing about school. I didn't like school to begin with, but this was just the nail in the coffin. I wasn't going to go sit through class and be in this bunch of pain. And I had to, like, I literally had to, like, scream and yell at my dad, like, Dad, you don't understand how bad this pain is. It's nothing I want to deal with. It's, it's crazy. So over the next, like, 8 to 12 months, we figured out that... This tumor had wrapped around the nerve, and that it's suppressing it, and it's causing this trigeminal, trigeminal neuralgia, which is chronic nerve pain. It goes from my right ear across to my nose, and it's just this, it's like razor blades being dug in under my skin, and then heated up, and then violently wrenched out over and over and over and over. So this this nerve pain is bad. It does what it does, and I, they put me on all these things, steroids, which made me suicidal anti-seizure medicines which made me angry I pulled a knife on my dad like I, and I'm a very cool mellow person I would never intentionally pull a knife on someone unless they were really like threatening me and my dad wasn't he was trying to like talk me down out of whatever and I just reached over and grabbed this knife it's like if you don't back up I don't know what I'm gonna do but it and next thing I know I got this knife kicked out of my hand <laughs> uh, two blind guys fighting was hilarious uh, it it kind of screwed with my life for a while, and uh, finally I get on these pills and come to find out they're used for heroin addicts coming down off heroin, and they're a strong opiate. And methadone is the name, but methadone worked. I'd been on Oxycontin, Vicodin, Percocet, 
Dilaudid, any generic of those, all the opiates you could think of, and that they weren't working. They weren't touching it. They, I mean, I would sit there and take, you know, a, my allotted dose and go to school and take another dose, and it just, nothing was working. I was sleeping through school. I was feeling like crap, but finally this method didn't work out. And I was on it for... Oh, man, see, we got methadone at 14, so I got off methadone at like age 22, so 8, 12, 10 years, like that, something like that. And it started screwing with my, um, I ended up getting my gold bladder taken out about two years ago. I was just, I had to get off of it. It had, was destroying my body from the inside out. It, it helped, but... I came up back up, I was living in Missouri at the time, and I came back up to Washington when I graduated and turned 18, and I got on medical cannabis, and it, it helped, it did way more than the, the Dilaudid, or I'm sorry, the methadone did, and so I slowly coming down off the opiates and switched over to cannabis and did all this great stuff with it. I can't describe, I mean I can't, I can just go on for days with adjectives, but until you're actually in this situation, you have no idea, like, stub your toe and then just smoke a joint, and just watch the pain go away, like, if, if you could do that, like, and like, okay, so, stubbing your toe, the pain goes away for a while, I guess, after a while, but like, if you could like, stub your toe and then smoke a joint instantly after that, and have the effects kick in right away, that's exactly what it does. It, it takes the pain, it makes it go away. Whereas opiates masks the pain and hides it completely. Cannabis allows you to be aware of the pain, but it's nothing you can't handle. It's 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 gone in the sense that it's not a problem. You can function, but you know it's there. Whereas opiates mask the pain and make it seem like your life's in a better situation. And this is where addiction comes in. Because addiction makes when you're in that kind of situation of the core of the chronic pain and wanting to get away from the pain you'll do anything to do that and the opiates offer this quality of life that is 10 times better than what you are what you are in with the pain but it's not a hundred percent of what you used to be before the pain so where people see you as being this bright intelligent person you go on these opiates, and yes, you're bright and intelligent, but you're also under the control of chemicals, and your mind changes. You, you, your inhibition or your amb your ambitions change. You want to do different things than what you wanted to do. Like I wanted to be a lawyer, and then I got on opiates, and I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to do any of that. I wanted to be a psychologist, but I moved away from that because it was. Opiates were great, and they gave me a functioning life, but they also made it so that my mind was locked off to me in certain ways. And cannabis allowed that to be reversed. I was able to do way more with cannabis. I was able to sit down and be a better musician, be a better writer, be a better communicator. And I didn't want to sit alone with headphones in. 24-7, not saying a word to anybody, to being a social person, and that, that really gave me back part of my life. Um, I still have to take opiates because, as much as cannabis does help, it isn't socially acceptable to just bust out a joint in the middle of a doctor's office or in the middle of class, whereas it's easier to get away with that by popping a pill or whatever. And I know some of you who do use cannabis are going to say, well, why don't you use metabols or whatever. And the thing with metabols is my metabolism handles them really weirdly. I ate a 50 milligram brownie, didn't do crap. Then two days later, I ate a 10 milligram candy bar, chew. Like a, uh, they're like kind of like milk duds. Milk duds, if you want to sponsor me, that'd be great. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> that 10 gram chew just blew me away so it's really weird and I know the source of both of those candies and they they were definitely dosed the way they say they were so that's kind of my life in a nutshell cancer cancer tumors 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 chronic pain chronic pain stomach pain ADD <laughs> that's the medical side of it now 
the actual living inside. I'm a writer. I have books in the works. I write songs. I do lyrics. I play guitar. I play piano. Love the outdoors. Even though I don't do as much of it as I'd like, I love being outside. Which is why this is being recorded outside at 2.30 in the morning. 45 degree weather. So, good times. So, I'm going to smoke a quick toke. And then I'll get back to talking. I actually originally came out here to just smoke a bowl. And then I was like, you know what, let's turn it into a recording. I am smoking Dutch Street. I know I said that like someone asked me a question, but <laughs> it just popped in my head to tell you guys what I was smoking. Um, I'm smoking Dutch Street from a local rec shop here in my local area. I live in Washington State, in case I didn't mention that. So the weed is kind of, I don't know, I was buying from dispensaries before we got rec shops here. And I, I really miss dispensaries. They had really good stuff. And they say here the stuff's good, but it's stale. It tastes like it's been sitting on the shelf for eight months. Whereas the stuff at the dispensary, you know, it was cured within a month and you were smoking it. That was pretty awesome. So, I don't know. Dutch Street's pretty good. This, is a, this has a high, uh, I think it's like 29%, which is, I don't know, whatever. I've had stuff that was way better, but like I said, I can't be picky. Considering I walked in and said, hey, what's the cheapest stuff you have? <laughs> but, um... I just, I hate buying from rec stores. It's just... I don't know if you guys can hear the frogs or not, but, yeah. There's, like, frogs and traffic in the background. I'm smoking out of a glass piece, a little pipe. I've always loved uh, pipes, like they're pretty cool. And this one's just a kind of a, I can tuck it up a sleeve, slip it in a pocket, throw it in my backpack. Pretty good, little pipe. What I really want is a uh, stone pipe, then I can't break it, because I'm notorious for breaking glass pieces. I've never had a pipe for more than a year, ever. That's where I'm at with that. I've had bubblers, I've had bongs, I've I had a bong for less than twenty four hours. It's sad. It's shattered. I have this awesome Sherlock that I had bought in like nah I had it a good while. And it was a long like I call them cheech pipes because they're really long, like just long pipes with a big bowl. And um it was thin glass, and that was my mistake. And I was loading it, and it slipped off the table and shattered. And what was cool was the bowl was still intact, so I was able to save the weed, which was out of out of a disaster. Was I guess the silver lining? It just I mean it sent glass all over the kitchen. I had to clean that up, and being blind and cleaning up glass is is like uh, it's slow. Because you have to be very careful not to like cut yourself and like when you're because you have to use your hand to like feel around for the glass. So if you put your hand down too quick or move too fast, you're gonna cut yourself. I was like a cop going into a pocket on a drug dealer. That's what it was like. I'm looking for some stone pieces and uh, maybe even some bone pieces um, of animal, not human. I know some people collect like human bone pipes, and that's I don't know. That's too weird for me. Or a silicone pipe, that'd be cool. Like a rubber pipe that can never break. But I guess you'd have to find a way to make it with like fire resistant material. And would that give off like chemicals if you burned it or if you like heated it up over and over? <coughs> it's been fun, guys. This is just to kind of get something up on my channel to kind of introduce myself and talk about who I am and what I am. Well, I don't know, talk about what I'm about, but. Basically, cannabis advocacy, psilocybin advocacy, and promoting the crap out of like, keeping ourselves as individuals as free as possible against control of what should be our right to 
medicine and quality of life and not have labels put on us like addiction cannabis user so yeah peace